Welcome everyone. <clears throat> this is the kickoff event for the Applied Anthropology Network's new online event series, Career Paths, Anthropology Beyond Academia. My name is Olivia Schneider. I'm current co-convener of the Applied Anthropology Network and I will be hosting today's event. So in the next hour, we will talk about what job opportunities anthropologists have, what skills they bring to the non-academic sectors and what some of the challenges for those wishing to transition into these careers are. But before we start, let me give you a quick overview of the agenda for today. So I will start off by giving a very quick introduction to the Applied Anthropology Network, as well as the Career Pass event series, as well as introducing our guests. Then we'll hear uh, a bit more from them and about their book before having a bit of a conversation. And at the end, we'll open up for questions from the audience. Um, you can already now start submitting questions throughout the event via the Q&A tool that you can find on the bottom of your screen. And it also gives you the option to submit questions anonymously if you prefer to do so. So for those of you that are not familiar with the Applied Anthropology Network yet, we are one of the many networks of EASA, the European Association for Social Anthropologists. AAN was established in 2010 to change the image and position of our discipline in Europe and beyond, and to share how anthropology can be employed in changing the world for the better. So our mission overall is to popularize the value of anthropological methods and approaches in different areas and sectors. Um, AAN's main initiatives include things like the annual conference, who are the world needs anthropologists, the apply clubs, as well as the mentorship program. And you can learn more about them on our website that we'll be posting in the chat soon. And with this event, we're excited to launch our new initiative, the Career Pass event series. One of the most common questions anthropology students or recent graduates get, for example, from the families and that they often struggle to have a clear answer for is, what can you even do with an anthropology degree? Universities often focus on purely training their students to become academics and are neglecting training them in how they can apply their skills in other sectors. As not everyone can or wants to continue in the academic path, this is a great oversight that leads to many wondering what career options they even have. Thus, the Career uh, Pass initiative was born and is dedicated to exploring these diverse uh, career opportunities for anthropologists outside of the academic context and providing practical insights about how to transition into more applied sectors. The event series will include workshops, roundtables, and interactive networking sessions that are offering information and guidance on career development for anthropologists and other social scientists. All events are fully free, online, and open to everyone. And we're starting it off today with today's event and with our great speakers, Marsha Cohen and Lawrence Bucker. Marsha is a senior advisor at the uh, business consultancy Old Equipe, and Lawrence is an associate professor at the University of Amsterdam. Together with Walter Fay, they wrote the book, Anthropologists Wanted, Why Organizations Need Anthropology, that was published in 2021. In the book, they interviewed a range of anthropologists and employers and shared really interesting and very honest insights into finding a job and working in non-academic spaces. Thank you so much for joining us today, Marsha and Lawrence. Can you tell us a bit more about yourself and how the book came to be? Yes, certainly. Uh, thanks very much, Olivia, for this introduction and also for the uh, invitation. Um, well, to start very briefly, my name is Lawrence Bakker. As you said, I work at the University of Amsterdam in the Department of Anthropology. I've been working in academia for quite some time now. But before that, I worked actually after I finished my master's, I thought I should do something with my anthropology that is more exciting than a university. So I worked in business mostly for a couple of years until I found that, well, it might be fun to actually uh, do a PhD, which I then did. And then I yeah, stuck uh, to the university. Um, and in the university, I kind of combine doing applied research and, um, and more academic material. And well, we can go into in a second why that is and what it meant for the book, because it's, yeah, the reason why I was involved in writing the book, but perhaps Masha, it's nicer to. Uh... Oh, and now he's losing connection. I think. Yes. One second. Yeah. Now you're well, back. I, I can uh, hear you again. Do you hear me, right? Except if Masha is frozen. You, Marcia, yes. No, you were frozen. Um. Yeah, well, I, I will introduce myself first. Um, I'm Masha Cohen, and um, my studies were during the 90s uh, in Amsterdam, anthropology. 
And uh, of course, I work for some NGOs like Amnesty International and the Revici Company and some more. And then I ended up in the uh, municipality of Amsterdam uh, and for a lot of years uh, until 2021, I think. And then I started as an advisor um, at the place I'm working right now. And in all that time, I used my anthropological skills, but, and that's the answer to the first question or the question Lawrence uh, asked, uh, why this book, why did, did I want to write this book? Um, because I, when I started working at a local, um, or at a municipality of Amsterdam, um, I didn't realize the added value um, being an anthropologist, what I brought already uh, to this applied world that came after, well, I had already been work working for years for uh, the municipality. Um, and it was because I viewed uh, policy differently uh, from my non-anthropological colleagues. Uh, for example, I was doing youth uh, policy and um, rather than simply aligning with uh, what the elder men wanted, I wondered what young people themselves thought about youth policy. And today it's more common to think and work this way, but at that time it wasn't. People find me annoying, like, oh, there's Masha again, wondering how young people see things. Uh, and that's when I really understood that I was always looking through my anthropological lens that I had skills that others didn't have, like being able to bring the perspective of youth into the organization. And looking back, I realized that I missed that focus during my studies, uh, the idea of understanding my value as an anthropologist in the non-academic world. And that was one thing that inspired me to write this book because I wanted to tell students earlier than I knew uh, what their added value is as an anthropologist in the applied world. And another reason uh, for writing the book is the lack of understanding about uh, anthropology in general outside the university. Employers don't know what they can expect from an anthropologist. Um, and I wanted to give anthropologists who have to start at the labor market um, language to explain their skills and added value to employers in a way that employers understand them. It's like a translation between the academic world and the applied world. Yeah, so, so far. When we met up, Masha was working in the municipality of Amsterdam. I was working in the university. And my reason for wanting to write a book like this is that um, I was happily teaching students all sorts of courses and I was doing my research. But at some point it also started to dawn on me that, well, we're teaching all these students to be academics, which is well and good, but we know that only a couple of percent of them will actually get an academic career. And that is partly because there are not that many academic jobs, but also not everybody wants to be an academic. Quite a lot of people uh, yeah, who do a study, but then yeah, are looking for work somewhere else. And the strange thing to me seemed that there was no attention for that in the university at the time. It didn't really, it did not feel really fair to put it that way. And I thought, well, can we change that? And I thought, yeah, we can. Because as I was doing my, uh, well, as I said, I worked in business for some time, which was interesting. And I found that I could do that very well as an anthropologist because it allowed me to find out why people wanted certain things and why they thought of them in certain ways. Um, so basically, if we had an order coming in, it was interesting to find out what that person thought he or she was ordering, what they needed it for, and so on and so forth. So basically, not just saying, okay, this is the order, let's, let's do it, but also find out and customers like it, because sometimes you could advise them like, well, you're ordering this, but you seem to be wanting something else. Is that true? And when I went on to do my PhD, I did that actually half in anthropology, half in the law faculty. 
But what I found out there was that in a law faculty, it's very common for staff at university to, especially senior staff, to not just work at university, but to also second version with which they really use and apply their skills outside of academia. Not so in anthropology, where this was seen as something that was a bit strange or something that was, yeah, not what you did. And that surprised me because um, I figured that does not make sense, particularly if you want our students to know what's going on outside of the university. And there's also a bit of a, uh, yeah, of an issue there, I think, with many anthropology departments, because most of the people who work in an academic job in a university work there exactly because they're very good at being academics. And many have never done anything except being an academic. So to teach about what's going on outside of the university in terms of careers uh, was a bit of a difficult thing. And we now have staff that has such experience. And um, I'm very happy to say that we have various courses that, that focus on this matter. But for us, that was a reason, or for us, for me, that was my main reason to want to write a book like this, to inform students about what else is going on with anthropology in the world, except universities. And we first wrote a book in Dutch, uh, which was published in uh, 2020. Um, then I started using it for a course. Then the whole bachelor program at my university switched to English in 2021. So we got an uh, English translation of the book. And that's, of course, a good thing because many more people in the world understand and read English than, uh, than Dutch. But that is how we got uh, uh, the book out and why the book was written. And two things with that. The first is that uh, the book is now running out of stock, which is nice. Uh, and we are working on a new edition, which is going to be published in uh, spring of next year. Um, should people know the book or have read the book, have specific ideas or maybe suggestions about how we can improve upon it or things they have missed, uh, we would be very grateful if you could let us know. Um, because yeah, then we still have uh, an opportunity to take that uh, that with us. And in addition to that, I'm also wondering how many people here uh, already know know about our book or read it. Just curious how wide it is already known in Europe and further. I mm. can see. Yeah. And before we move to uh, yeah to the actual content, let's say of the talk. Um, we should also put, uh, pass on the regards of Walter Pye, our uh, third co-author. He couldn't be here tonight, um, but he was very exciting that we're having uh, this talk. And um, we also asked him, of course, like, why was it again that you wanted to, uh, to write this book? And Walter very much is a consultant uh, who studied anthropology and who works very much in the world of consultancy. Um, the, the fast, yeah, I think it's a fast business if you compare it to what I do, um, which is not a bad thing. Um, and actually, he said that, well, what's going wrong with anthropology is that uh, the marketing doesn't work. Anthropologists are very poorly at putting out there what they can do, why they are useful, why they have skills that are necessary uh, in so many organizations and so many uh, forms of collaboration. And that is something that he wanted to change. He wants to improve, if you like, the image of anthropology, specifically in the organizational world and the business world, and get, yeah, get out there what uh, anthropologists do. So we came up with a book that brought these perspectives of the three of us together. And yeah, that is trying to do a bit uh, of all of that. Um, when I started using it at university, we used it in the first year, at the end of the first year, in a course that was on anthropological careers, um, which is nice because it gives students a bit of a perspective on yeah, what you might uh, go on and do once you've uh, finished your bachelor, if your master in anthropology. And of course, that's the first year, there's still several years to go. Right now, uh, uh, the book is returned to in the third year, another career course, but then that is far more on using anthropology outside of the university and thinking of what you might be doing with it. And it's again used in the masters. And um, that's not because of me, that's just because 
um, yeah, some of my colleagues picked up the book and enjoyed reading it. And yeah, in certain ways, it can be read by people at various stages of their, uh, their career. For first years, it's very much like, well, what can you do with it? Third years, it's uh, okay, how am I going to do that? And fourth years is, hmm, right now, uh, I'm going to look for a job quite soon. Uh, what was it again? And what sort of tips or ideas might there be in there that, uh, that could be of use uh, to us? So those were our reasons for uh, writing this book and um, what we hope to achieve with it. Um, we had a few questions actually that, that went with this and uh, perhaps Olivia, it's uh, good to move to the next slide. And um, thank you. I guess I uh, discussed the question of why this book or we discussed the question, uh, why this book for the both of us and what we see they hope to achieve with it. Um, an important element with that is of course the matter of the impact of anthropologists, the specific skills that people dispose of, um, the matters of translation and explanation, and the idea of stepping up and giving recommendations. And what we mean by those is the impact of anthropologists. And if you think about where anthropologists go and what they do, and who else is there, uh, then it's often important to realize that there are not that many anthropologists in the world. Um, if you think, for instance, about organizations, organizational studies, um, there are far more people who either majored in the field like organizational studies or studied political sciences or sociology and so on and so forth. And quite often those are yeah, the competition, if you like, that anthropologists uh, might need to compete with. Um, that makes it anthropologists can be special and they can also be a bit strange. And of course, the thing is to combat that, um, that strangeness. There often still is this image of anthropologists as people who go out somewhere very far away to study a remote group of people and then write a very thick book about them with possibly everything you want to know about those people, but no direct uh, relevance or impact. And of course, that's not true. But at the same time, it also gives anthropologists this image of, hmm, these are people who can go out somewhere, who do research on people and yeah, who do that in certain ways that are different from political scientists and so on. What, what can these people bring? What, what sort of skills do they have on offer that, um, yeah, that others do not have? And Marcia, would you like to uh, bring up that matter of skills? You had this nice example that you just mentioned this afternoon. Uh, you mean like, uh, and I don't know what, what example you, you mean, but like my, my own work practice at the moment? Yeah. Okay. Like an, yeah, it's, it's just an example of my work nowadays. Um, um, so, um, currently, I'm working uh, at the public health service of Amsterdam, and among other tasks, tasks they have asked me to provide uh, advice on how they can better con contribute to the topic of physical activity. In short, Amsterdam residents don't exercise enough, which is bad for their health. Uh, they want to do this in collaboration with another part of the municipality the sports and exercise department. Um, both departments are involved with the team exercise. But how can a public health service contribute optimally is the question, and they want advice on that. Um, well, what I'm doing is like a small field work. That's what I'm doing as an anthropologist. I talk to many people from both departments about what they do, but also, also how they view each other in the context of their collaboration. And um, with the anthropological lens, lens which I uh, mentioned before, you very quickly realize that both parts of the municipality are uh, essentially working in isolation from each other. They use different languages, have different approaches, and as a result, they are talking like this, past each other. Um, the public health service 
is much more academic, uh, working from research, and they do not view exercise as a separate issue, but as a part of a bigger picture. Uh, for example, uh, to be able to move well, uh, public spaces must also be, be suitable for that. So a more uh, holistic approach. Um, while a sports and exercise department is primarily focused on providing enough activities for all Amsterdam residents and ensuring, ensuring there's enough funding for that. Um, they are therefore talking, like what I told, they pass each other without, without realizing that. And uncovering this, um, translating to both organizations what the other is doing and how they do it and why, and then facilitating uh, a conversation about how they can work together more effectively is, in my opinion, a particularly an anthropological challenge. And that's what I'm doing. And But I don't know if I give examples of specific, yeah, I do, I think, uh, qualities of anthropologists or skills. I guess it's very much, I mean, we have had this discussion, discussion a couple of times. It's working outside of academia often means that you're doing research for a third party that has a question. And that question can be very concrete, like how do we get people in Amsterdam to exercise more, to engage in sports more? But of course, it's a very broad question. And yeah, the issue then that we find that we often run into is a question, okay, why do you want to know this? Um, what do you think is going on? And what is the sort of solution um, that you are looking for? Are you looking for people who exercise more because it's better for their health? Do you want them to have a different day schedule? Uh, do you want them to eat differently? What is the reason that you are asking this question? Um, and what do you actually want to know from, uh, from these people? Yeah. So we find very often that when we're doing this sort of research for outside partners, um, so actually people who, who want an answer to a question from us, uh, that we're not just doing the research like, oh, you want to know how many people sport and what they do? Oh, okay, we'll go and find out. But actually, that research goes two ways. It's not just it's asking the, the question. No, it's the question behind the question. Yeah. It's, but why do you want to know this? The actual what do you question. Want to do? Why? Yeah. What is the purpose? Yeah. And we think that that is a question, sorry, a skill that anthropologists are particularly good at. Um, this idea of finding out what it is that uh, people actually want to know, what they need it for, what the purpose of the exercise is. And when you then have various parties involved who, yeah, as Masha just explained, officially talk to one another, but unofficially are talking about on different levels with different same concepts of different meaning, then this idea of translation comes to the fore. Um, making sure that they get an understanding of what the other is doing and thinking and meaning. And an explanation, if you like, of what is going on in terms of process between the two of them. So we think that outside academic research, a lot of what we're actually doing is yeah, finding out how these processes work, what the thoughts and interpretations behind them are, the assumptions, the emphasis purposes, but also the way in which such parties think about each other and the potential of, of collaboration, for instance. So this idea of translating between the different ideas, explaining what's going on, um, is something that we feel is a very anthropological skill, going beyond what is being said as, okay, this is the question, but finding out why the question is there and what is meant by the question. Um, and in that sense, uh, making the effort to speak, if you like, the language of the people you're working with, getting their understanding of what it is that they're doing. If you like immersing yourself in their culture, and if it's then two organizations, yeah, you could consider them as two different cultures, two different groups um, who come in contact and yeah, which we are kind of to, to mediate um, an answer to the question for. I see a question in the chat. I don't know if, if you want to answer them right now. 
Um, yeah, we can definitely. Yeah, do it's that. a question to me actually, but feel free. Go ahead if you want to answer. Now uh, there's a question about if I've got contact to the decision makers also, and how do I make myself heard? Which I think is a nice question because not only in this uh, particular case, but in general, as an anthropologist, how do you make yourself clear? Um, and actually, I'm not always doing that good enough because I don't call myself an anthropologist all the time. I call myself uh, an advisor or a consultant. And as a consultant, and uh, I'm hired uh, now into the municipality, I can go through all layers of the organization, which make it easy to, to also talk to a decision maker or policy maker or whoever. So. Uh, in answer to the first question, do we also have contact to decision makers? Yes. And how do you make yourself heard? Um, I try to sit at the right tables. Um, because as an anthropologist, I think you also analyze what's going on and who are the ones with power. And this can be informal power and formal power. And um, the people are in who have got a lot of power informal are the people I try to get uh, in contact with and share my uh, thoughts, etc. And they're again on the right tables to bring, if it works out, the message I've got. I don't know if I'm clear, but it's like, um, oh, I mean, there's a lot of thoughts. Um, is is it clear, or do I do I should I add something? I think maybe you can again try to uh, clarify what exactly you mean in in a short sentence. Just uh, to make sure. Well, it's, in short, it's to get at the right tables. <laughs> to but because you you are an anthropologist, you know what you you can find out easily what are the right tables, and how to get there through. Um, informal leaders. Speaking word of letters and to whom, finding out who those people are, and yeah, kind of make it, yeah, kind of finding out what the structures are, and the fact that you can convince the director does not mean that um, the people one or two levels below the director will actually accept what you have to say. That's what you mean, right? And that you need to find out who the people are on that level that yeah that you will engage with. And actually, I think that's also in relation to uh, questions we were asked beforehand. Uh, and indeed, as Veronica said, basically you have to be a good detective. That is true. You need to find out what the connections are, what the lines of influence are. And usually there's an informal one as well. And on, yeah, and once you get a feeling of both, uh, yeah, as in most anthropological research, that is a way to yeah to find your way around and to find out um, yeah what is really going on within, uh, for instance, the municipality. But um, just to finish what's on the slide, there's one last thing, and that is in relation to questions we were asked beforehand in terms of skills and things that are necessary. And one thing um, we find a lot at the university. Uh, as a skill that students often are omitted to uh, to be taught, is the issue of stepping up and formulating recommendations. Um, you may well know in academia, uh, writing is very precise, uh, very detailed, uh, and the issue is to really show where you're coming from, how it's based in theory, and so on and so forth. Uh, a master of thesis can easily be 40 pages, uh, perhaps 20,000 words, uh, and the conclusion will be several pages. If you provide um, an advice for a company, an organization, we are generally not looking for that. They may be looking for something that's one or two pages, and that consists of bullet points of what should be done. And that's a whole different way of writing. And what I found myself when I started doing that, um, part is my PhD and part uh, once out of my PhD, uh, is that it takes a different mindset. 
uh, we are taught to be very nuanced, very specific, not to make too grand assumptions. But this is the other way around. You need to make grand assumptions. You need to make things uh, very concrete, perhaps more concrete than you would like them to be. Um, but that doesn't mean that you need to lie or to oversimplify. Um, in the end, bullet points could be seen, if you like, as the headings of various chapters to which you can add the substance, which you can because you know it, um, once there's a request for you to do so, to explain what made you arrive at this heading, this bullet point. But doing that, stepping to the front and saying, look, I, as your advisor, I, as the anthropologist, can actually come up with these uh, recommendations, this, 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 and this. That is a skill that many anthropology students and also many uh, academics uh, often lack. And it's something that we feel uh, should require more attention in, uh, in anthropological training. Um, actually, Olivia, maybe we can do away with the slides and uh, yeah, move back to the talking heads. Yeah, I think there's an important question again in, in the chat. Because um, we are talking about anthropologists who are already inside uh, the, the working world, but there are, there's a question from someone asking how to how to get a job actually as an anthropologist because you or she I don't know wait um, I still don't know um, it, it, just, it, it just doesn't work. Just no, to get a but do get a job, it doesn't work out yet. And there, there, I will read it. Thanks for this insight. But I feel we're not showing ourselves enough academic kindness. It's close to a year now. I can't find a host in Germany for a research fellowship. Have not been able to get a. Um, what was the other question? Yeah, it was uh, to get a forensic scientist anthropologist to host me. What do I need to do? I've always followed the standard of cold emails this is maybe a specific too specific but like how it's it's the last uh bullet point of the slide like how do you get how do you get in the working world was this i mean this sounded a bit as if it was a question for an academic position i think or, it's an academic position so but we have to explain both i think or we wrote ah, about it both <laughs> yeah definitely but maybe, we, but maybe because of 90% of the people end up outside the academic world, it's maybe a good idea to start with that one first. Yeah, like, well, but I can say something about academia quickly, of course. Okay. Um, because indeed getting a job in academia can be a serious hassle or is a serious hassle. I think the first bottleneck is to get a PhD position uh, because yeah, nobody will, or at least as far as I know, Few academic institutions will hire people without uh, a PhD, at least not for permanent positions. And indeed, once a PhD is obtained, it's moving on to postdoc and then, yeah, to try and achieve a permanent position, which is second or third bottleneck. And in my own experience, that is a process that took me about uh, eight years going out of a PhD and getting to a permanent contract. And yeah, I had a permanent contract in business, didn't like it enough, so moved to uh, the instability, if you like, of academia. Um, and I moved around. I had uh, temporary jobs at various universities, uh, teaching, researching, slowly building up a CV, and publishing uh, at the same time. And if I'm thinking back now to the moment that I uh, obtained a permanent position, I'm still thinking there would not there have been people who were more qualified in terms of publications, in terms of uh, grants obtained than, than I was. There probably were. Um, I do know they told me later on that they hired me because I had both publications and grants and teaching experience and a network and body, 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 body. But I think there is almost an element of chance to it. It depends on who's in the, the hiring committee, it depends on what they're looking for. And there are far more people who want to work in academia uh, than that there are positions. And 
yeah, that's not a very nice thing to uh, story to tell, perhaps. Um, but I think it's true. Um, for some reason, many, many people want to work in academia. And I can tell you many things uh, about why it's nice to work there while I'm working there myself. Um, but yeah, there are also many things that make it a lot less nice to, uh, to work there. But the other issue, uh, as Masha pointed out, is that we're also talking about jobs outside of university. And an important thing there often is if, if you're applying for a job, um, is that again, you're competing with others, maybe other anthropologists, maybe other people from other disciplines, most likely. Chances are that you are the only or one of the few anthropologists applying. So you may need to show what specific skills you have, what specific uh, matters you can bring to this position that the others uh, do not dispose of. Um, and then the thing usually is not to tell people like, yes, I'm a very good uh, ethnographer, or I'm very good at, uh, uh, at interviewing, or I've done master's research in uh, this or that subject uh, that may be relevant to you. That's all good. That all adds to, your, to the, the information they didn't know about you, but they will want to know why you would be the person that fits with their organization or their job. So they may want to know how you see yourself or how your skills relate to what it is they are looking for. If, for instance, they're looking for somebody to uh, conduct research in certain elements or to be a, uh, a project manager, then it's a good thing if you can tell them that you did your master's research for several months somewhere. But it's also a good thing that you tell them that you manage the program of doing your master's research, which entailed making a research planning, a time uh, a timeline, budgeting, and so on and so forth, to show that you are actually capable of running and uh, managing a program, because that is what doing research effectively is. Um, this is again this translation thing quite often. It's you telling people how what you can do fits in with uh, what they are looking for. And they often do not realize they uh, actually do need an anthropologist because they know very little about anthropology. So the thing is to, uh, to translate and to demonstrate, if you like, what it is that you can bring to them, to the table, um, yeah, is often almost a skill in itself, but a very important one and something that, again, you, yeah. I mean, I may be, I, I may be sounding very grumpy about universities now, that is not my point. But teaching people a skill like this, like what it is to apply for a job and how that works is something that would really be of value, I think. And I think on that note, I would be curious, you know, about, you know, the lack of awareness by employers of what anthropologists are and can do and our lack of experience of how to explain it. Like if you had to give kind of like an elevator pitch explanation of like, what is anthropology? Like, what can you do? How would you explain it? May I ask for one more hint? Uh, who are we explaining it to? Let's say you're at a networking event and you're talking to someone from an organization, a company that you think is doing interesting work and you say, hey, I'm an anthropologist. And they're like, what is that? How would you explain it to them? Yeah. Can it be a company? Um, let's do something completely different from what we're doing right now. Uh, let's say it's a company that... Um, Hmm. For instance, this is a company that uh, that rents out uh, um, holiday homes in uh, in France. Given that I'm sitting in one at the moment, um, well, then one thing that I would bring up, they ask like, "Well, what's an anthropologist?" The answer would be like, "Well, an anthropologist is uh, somebody uh, who researches, who find out what the interests of people are, why people make the choices that they do, um, and given that you." rental uh, holiday home company are looking for somebody to help you out with your policy and how to address your, uh, uh, your market to a wider audience. Uh, what you probably want to know is why people are attracted to this specific region or to renting houses with you rather than with uh, a competing company. Um, what is it that they are looking for when they are looking for rental houses? Is it the house itself? Is it the location? Is it a swimming pool? Uh, what do they want? So I would say like, well, in this moment, I would go with the idea that 
anthropologists find out what attracts people to um, to act or behave in the way that they do. And I now gave it a bit of a commercial twist, but um, for instance, in, in real life, when I'm not here in France, I'm carrying out uh, a research project on undocumented immigrants in the Netherlands. Um, and then what, if I'm talking to, let's say, immigration services there, then I'm uh, talking about, if they ask, what do anthropo why uh, do you as an anthropologist work on this? Then my point is like, well, these people come here, they're looking for careers here actively, they're looking for jobs, some of them are quite successful in this. What makes that they come over here? What are the ideas that have them coming over? What are perhaps the, the fears that make them leave the place where they're from? So what is it that makes people act in the ways that they do? What is it that they are looking for in, uh, yeah, in coming over for the futures? I think we also have got a lot of examples, and I don't want to sell the book, but uh, in our book on how to make these translations, uh, how to um, also to, to give language to it. And, um, and my advice is also something else, but um, I think that when you're looking for a job, it's maybe not especially for an anthropologist, but in this world right now, uh, starting somewhere, as, as a student, if you're interested in a sort of field, just find out what companies are working in this field and just phone them for a cup of coffee or tea. Just and just tell them that you're interested in what they're doing and that you want to hear more about it. And when there is a vacancy later on, they will think, hey, we talked to this person. Maybe it's a nice vacancy for this or a nice job for this person. That's also how it works. So, and networking is also something we're good at. So use easy skills also, and don't think uh, this, this cold uh, applications uh, gives you less chance on the job, I think, than the warm context you can create. Thank you. And um, maybe one more question before we move on to the Q&A. Um, so we were talking a bit about what skills anthropologists already have that can be applied also to non-academic uh, projects and sectors. But I was wondering through your own experience as well as through the conversations that you had for the book, what's a skill that uh, is typically not part of anthropological training that is, you know, you see is very valuable or helpful um, in non-academic settings? Of course, I know this depends on the sector, but maybe you have an idea for one that you think is generally very helpful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I wished actually that um, during my studies I, I, that I had more op opportunities to practice um, or doing anthropological work already with real empl employers. Like, um, so you you need some more skills, like than the academic knowledge you get during your studies, like how to translate, how to. Um, which tools you can use, um, so how to practice anthropology in the outside world and how to find answers on questions from your employers or whatever. So I think that that, that should be something which can which would be great if it could be added that the studies its study itself. Yeah, I think I mean and uh, I'm sorry, Ali, I just saw it coming by uh, very quickly in the corner of my eye, but um, I think this person's name was Ellie, and uh, they've just posted quite an interesting set of ideas in the in the chat on this, which I thought like, yes, exactly, those kind of matters. Um, for myself, I would say two things. Uh, indeed, the, the capacity to, to make points concrete, even though then you lose specificity, but uh, uh, as I mentioned a bit earlier, specificity is something that's very valued in academia, um, but not necessarily outside of it. Um, you can give it or come up with it once it's required, but usually to get an idea across or a first feeling about what should be happening, um, it helps if you can be um, concrete, specific, coming, uh, coming up with uh, one sentence, if you like, rather than a whole explanation, and that links to all sort of 
theoretical ideas. And one element that links to that, um, and which is interesting if you compare anthropology to other studies, is that anthropologists are always a bit hesitant, it seems, to come up with, or many anthropologists, to come up with advice, ideas, uh, concrete matters. Um, I also noticed that in university, there's a hesitation of coming up with policy advice, for instance. Um, and that's quite interesting, because if you compare that to uh, political scientists, uh, uh, people who study law, uh, fields that, as we do, are very much engaged with persons, people, and real life, such hesitation is, yeah, is a lot less present and is often far more, uh, sorry, and those studies often give far more attention to, right? What are you going to do when you step out of university and you bring your skills into the real world? So this idea that anthropologists can step up and have good ideas, that is something to also, yeah, get into our system and make use of. It's not only complex and, um, uh, and with many dimensions, it's also something that you can tell to specific people at a given time and explain what, according to you, might work or might be a good idea. Thank you so much. Um, so one of the questions that came in, and please, uh, for everyone attending, please feel free to leave more also in the Q&A uh, too. But one question that came up was, what are some misconceptions or maybe even stereotypes of anthropologists by employers that, again, like you have come across or that you know about that might also make it a bit more difficult to find a job or um, convince someone of your value as, a, as an employee? I don't even think these are misconceptions. I think it's just a lack of knowledge about what an anthropologist is and what he, can, he or she can add. So it's a lack of knowledge. Like misconception, yes, like an anthroposophist or whatever, um, or the idea that you're only working uh, in, in some tropical spaces uh, uh, tropical to, to uh, research a tribe. Or, but it's just not knowing what because we are doing something wrong. We have to tell what we what we add and what are what makes us um, or what is our added value to the employer we're talking about with a misconception. There's a beautiful article um, which, of course, I can not right now remember the authors of. <laughs> but which looks at anthropologists in fiction, uh, specifically in movies. And um, what they found is that if anthropologists are depicted, uh, it's often in horror movies, um, which can be either ghosts, spirits, hauntings, and those kind of things, which the anthropologists then understand where it's coming from. It's uh, with cannibals and uh, weird monsters and so on in very far away remote locations, which then the anthropologists happen to know the legends behind. Uh, or, and now we're talking about the 70s and so on, it's, um, it's uh, soft porn movies of that time in which the anthropologists are very sexy people, obviously. But again, also quite remote and, and yeah, uh, working in places where uh, only that one anthropologist goes. Point being is that what uh, the people writing that article conclude is that, well, anthropologists are being put forward as these people who, de who dispose of this mythical, esoteric knowledge. They work by themselves, they're kind of loners who isolate themselves from society by going to these faraway places that they know all these things of, um, and who know all these things about ancient civilizations uh, in remote locations, uh, which is all well and good, but obviously not really true anymore. And that means that many people still disposing of this idea do not concretely understand what an anthropologist is. And as I said, that can be an issue because you need to explain to them that, hold on, I actually work in the city, I've done research for uh, the municipality and the uh, health service and so on. So that is my field of knowledge. But it can also be something you can use to your advantage because um, you're not a political scientist. You're not a sociologist, you're not a psychologist. Still, you're working with people, you're working on understanding people, translating people, but you're doing it in a way that all these other disciplines do not dispose of. So there's this 
X factor, if you like, or this um, secret bonus point, whatever you want to call it. And that is something that you can use to your advantage as well by, yeah, if you can point it out in a way that fits with the interests and the needs of the person or the uh, job that you're, uh, you're talking to. Thank you so much. Another question was, um, do you need a strong specialization, for example, in specific themes as an anthropologist to stand out when applying for jobs? Shall I go first? Hmm? You go first? Yeah, well, well, uh, we did research for, for our book. Um, we also asked people um, to, to uh, to help us to give us some insight of their own working practice and a lot of people say and I don't know if I agree or I don't want to agree actually is that it is helpful when you combine a study anthropology with a practical like with law or with um, whatever um, not a practical more practical study so you can bring in um, both into the, the when you when you start work, but actually, I think it's still we have to translate better what anthropology is and make more give it more language um, understandable for the people outside. I think that that's more valued than doing an, another master or um, or or a spe specific. I don't know what you think. It's a specific uh, master. Yeah, I think it depends. Um, if you're really certain that you want to work in a certain direction and really want to make a go at doing that, then a specialization might be a good idea. Of course. Um, on the other hand, um, it's also something that might change over time. Um, when I did my master's, I specialized in, in tourism in terms of research, which was very interesting. That was what my research is about. And before I finished my master's, I had a job as a tourist guide working in China and Tibet, which was wonderful at the time. I could never have gone there then uh, if I would not have had that job because I could never afford it. Um, by the way, it's a very bad idea to take a job like that when you're finishing your master's because it means that you're going to take longer to finish your master's. Don't do it. Um, but so when I graduated, I was kind of like specialized in tourism uh, research. Then I went on and my PhD, as I said, was in the law faculty uh, with anthropology. So when I graduated from that, I was kind of like an anthropologist working on law, which I still do, which is very interesting. And it's a huge field. And yeah, it's not that difficult to get projects within that. The past decade, I've been working a lot on militias, um, which to some extent requires specialized knowledge as well. But I think so. The answer to this question is two things. If you really want to go in a certain direction, um, yeah, yeah, I agree. To, to specialize in that. But once you're working in it, you might also find that you also have other interests and you might kind of swerve or start doing something else. And perhaps even before that, you start working in a certain field. Um, and then it's almost inevitable that you become a specialized in what it is that you're doing then. Because otherwise, uh, it will be difficult to carry out the job. I, I understood the question differently. Like, do you need something else besides anthropology to get a job? Like, do you need something extra? And then, yeah, right. And oh. Yes, if you want to specialize in something, but no, if just for selling yourself on the job market. Mm, yeah, I would say no. It's. Um, I mean, I, I had jobs. Uh, after graduating from anthropology, and um, that was as an intern, well, purely based on uh, on that uh, uh, on that study, and that worked very well. Yeah. Okay. Being mindful of the time, I would maybe ask one more question that I think is also going to be relevant for many people that are here right now. So if you could give one piece of advice to a recent graduate of either a master's or someone who's done their PhD or undergraduate, what would you say to them? What's one thing they should focus on? To get a job or for life or... Uh... For getting yeah. a job, I think. In, yeah, in the context of getting a job outside of academia. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think, uh, well, 
first of all, when you're interested in a, a kind of job, just inform yourself about uh, your uh, future employer. Uh, what language do we, does do we use? What um, uh, get a cup of tea or coffee at the place? Um, ask questions. Um, find out what they what they find important instead of what you find important. But what's their be an anthropologist and step into their world and find out what's important for them and then translate it to a job apply. I think that. That's something, and also believe uh, in yourself as an anthropologist that you are some added value because we are also a bit shy as an anthropologist and we already, um, I think it, it's it's a bad start to think bad about uh, your chances, uh, chances on the job market because that's not uh, a good thing to start with. So just believe in yourself as an anthropologist. And your added value. Just to pick up on that last bit, that is so recognizable. Um, I'm still trying to find out who, but in the university as well, I regularly get students who tell me like, ah, oh, I'm never going to find a job. And said, well, why not? I said, yeah, that's what that's that uh, the teacher told me. I said, which teacher? Because I like to talk to them. And said, yeah, well, no, 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 I'd rather not say. All right, and you don't tell me. But um, it really isn't true. I think I had last year, uh, I supervised three master students and um, I was phoned by a consultancy company. They asked like, oh, do you have a student who would, could come and do an internship with us because we're looking to hire anthropologists. And, oh, sure. There was were three, was one, it me? It wasn't you. Uh -huh. um, and um, I said, yeah, sure. Uh, let me just ask. And th this was about a month and a half after graduation. And I emailed these students and all of them already had jobs. And that is not because uh, I supervised them, but those were the three students that I happened to know that I thought, oh, these three I can recommend for sure. But um, yeah, a lot really depends, uh, I think, on finding jobs on both how you approach it, see it as a research project, as Marcia said, uh, about not only presenting yourself and what you've done so far, but how you would fit in and how that would fit their needs and their interests. And if you don't get hired, don't take that person uh, because that's not what it is. People who do these hirings, they see lots of letters. Uh, they hardly see people. Um, they make selections based on, on small written texts and CVs. Um, it's hardly about you. It's, hard, it's mostly about some specific elements that they may or may not be looking for and that you based against a competition whom you don't know about because you have not seen their letters. So if you do not get invited for job interviews, that says very little. It basically says that there are lots of other people who also like to get a job like that. And there may be anthropologists, there may be other people, um, but it doesn't mean very much. Thank you. I think that's a very good note to end on. Um, I know we didn't get to a lot of the questions that we got, but I think many of them are answered in your book, for example, kind of industries, people working, what kind of job titles there are. So make sure to give it a read. And we will also bring some of the maybe more specific ones about specific industries into some future events that we have on those industries. So maybe to end off one, I would like to share a quote that I really liked that it really stuck with me from the book when I was reading it shortly after I graduated. And it is, um, be daring, dare to make mistakes, give tentative answers, choose a position, make a stand, pick a definition of culture. Because if we do not do it ourselves, others will do it for us. Pick the frame before the frame picks you. What is the story we want to tell about ourselves? So thank you all so much for joining us today. And thank you, thank you to our guests, Masha and Lawrence, for the insightful conversations. Um, for all of you that attended today, or for those of you that are watching the recording, uh, we'd love for you to ask you to fill out an anonymous feedback form to just let us know what you thought about the event and um, uh, what we maybe could improve also for the future. You can also submit some ideas for topics that you would like to see in future events on the Padlet, which is the second link that has been shared. And uh, also make sure to give their book a read. It's really interesting. It's very insightful and also very motivating in many ways. 
Um, so as I said before, the event will be recorded and the recording will be shared on our YouTube channel in a few days. So feel free to rewatch it or send it to people you think might be interested in this. And we're also already able to announce the next event. So yeah which will be a workshop on job search strategies for anthropologists on December 12th. You are now already able to sign up for that. And yeah, we're looking forward to seeing many of you there. It will again be, of course, recorded and shared afterwards for those of you that might not be able to join that day. And lastly, you can learn more about the Applied Anthropology Network and there are other initiatives and activities on our website. And if you want to stay up to date on upcoming events and other activities by us, um, make sure to follow us on all of our socials as well as subscribe to our newsletter. So thank you all again so much for joining and hope to see you next time. Bye. Thanks very much, Olivia, for the invitation. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.